Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture. Today I'd like to start off by answering uh, a question, which is the, the main question dealing with what we'll be talking about in this course, and that is what is a mathematical model? And you know, this is going to be the main thing that we'll be studying in this course. So uh, before we get started, we want to kind of have a, a good idea of exactly what a model, model is and what it constitutes. Um, and I guess I, I should start off by saying that this is a loaded question with many possible definitions. Um, we make mathematical models daily. Without even thinking about it or without paying attention. And to give you a good example of this, Think about one of the, the most basic questions that you might ask yourself is how do I get downtown or how do I get to a place? And there's many factors that you might uh, consider and you might not even realize that you're considering and weighing these factors against one another but uh, for one and the distance of where you're going is one of the factors that is going to factor into this decision um, the money that you want to pay to get there whether you want to take the bus or ride a bike or drive a car um, and this brings up another very important factor, which is time, or traversal time. How long do you want to take to, to, on, on the trip? Do you want to walk? Take a very long time, if, but if it's a short distance, you can walk in uh, no, no time at all. Another consideration that you might make is security. How, how do you want to get there? Are you, you bringing money with you? Are you carrying money on you or anything valuable on you? Um, and then this also brings up, you know, all these are kind of related to one another, but the means of transportation. So are you taking the bus? Are you going to uh, order an Uber? Are you going to bike? Um, another factor is, you know, your mood. Are you rushing? It's kind of related to time and, and distance. Are you, are you rushing to get somewhere? Uh, do you, are you having a kind of a leisurely, leisurely stroll? Um, but uh, you know, there are many other examples, and there are also, in this example, many other factors that you might want to consider. But there's one simple example of how uh, we, we create a mathematical model uh, you know, all, all the time uh, when we're solving problems uh, without even realizing it sometimes. So to, to put a definition down to mathematical modeling is not necessarily the, the easiest goal, but uh, again, like I said, I'll, I'll try to describe it. And a lot of the examples and uh, the material, specifically this definition that I'm about to write down, uh, comes from a very, very, very good textbook from uh, one of my advisors, uh, Meyer Humi. And this is the textbook, Introduction to Mathematical Modeling. And if you're going to get any companion textbook for this course, I would recommend this, this textbook in, in addition to the others that I've provided in the syllabus, um, because this is a fantastic, fantastic overview and in-depth look at uh, many of the modern aspects to that modeling. 
but um, right now I'll write down the definition to mathematical modeling given in his book. Uh, in general, modeling is the art of describing in symbolic language this is where your mathematical and physics theories come in A real life system so that approximately correct predictions can be made regarding the behavior or the evolution of the system. And uh, there are a number of different takeaways here that we want to make from uh, this, de this definition. Um, the main ones being that modeling is an art. And what that means is that uh, there are, are no rigid rules hmm. outside of the confines. of the mathematical theory and we could also say physical theory here as well that you are using to describe the system. And um, this is a very, very important point. It really is an art. Um, and it's, it's an art that you, you kind of, you develop uh, over time. So you become better and better at it over time and with time and practice. And I also want to point out um, that uh, you know, so however here there are patterns these are patterns of be best practice that are common to good mathematical models, or to just good models.
and these help avoid many pitfalls that are common to creating mathematical models. The other uh, takeaway that I want to give you and that I want to point out about this definition is that correct predictions usually does not mean 100% accuracy. All mathematical models have limitations, and as such, it's up as us to the, cre who are the, the, the creators of the model, or the, those creating the models, to clearly state and investigate these limitations. And I should also put the user here as well. Because many times you can use a mathematical model and not be the, the creator of the mathematical model. Um, but regardless, if you're using a mathematical model or you create one, um, you have to determine the limitations and clearly state the limitations. The other thing that I want to point out when it comes to this correct predictions is that um, sometimes several models describe the same phenomena with varying degrees of accuracy and complexity. Sometimes uh, a model that is too complex, maybe a, a more accurate description of reality, but be very, very hard to apply. And uh, a simpler model will actually um, describe the, 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 the real life phenomena in a, in a much, uh, you know, an accurate enough way, and it'll be good enough. Um, and what I want to do is give you a very, very, very good example of this. And I won't be getting uh, too deep into the mathematics. Um, because the mathematics does go very deep. Um, however, what I, what I want to do is just kind of give you an idea of uh, an example of this um, you know, difference between similar mathematical models describing similar phenomena and how certain mathematical mo models can be uh, complicated um, in certain situations but be a better model of the real world. Uh, and specifically, what I want to do is uh, look at the example of waves, the wave equation. The, the wave equation takes different forms depending on the application that uh, you're considering. Uh, the most basic wave equation, and many times what uh, someone means when they say the wave equation is the linear wave equation.
I'm going to call this the basic model, and then the more advanced model mm -hmm. over here. be a nonlinear wave equation. Or even systems of nonlinear wave equations. So uh, I'll consider the 2D linear wave equation. Um, just to be exact here, and this describes, say, uh, you can think of it almost as like a, a membrane where the displacement function of the membrane, u, depends on t and say on two Cartesian coordinates, x and y. Uh, we can show you in some vector calculus that the rate of change of the rate of change of the height of the membrane, which is the acceleration of a given x, y point on the membrane. This is the second partial derivative of u with respect to time. Um, is directly equal to the wave speed squared times second partial derivative of u with respect to x plus the second partial derivative of u with respect to y. This is an equation that you may have briefly seen in a multivariable calc course. Um, uh, you're not, definitely not expecting to know it, but hopefully uh, you have reviewed your partial derivatives. Um, and essentially what this is saying is uh, uh, an expression of Newton's law, Newton's second law of motion, for every given point on the elastic membrane. Um, so really, if we draw a coordinate system, we think of our membrane as, say, being a sort of surface that goes up and down from various points on the surface. What we're uh, studying when we solve this uh, is exactly uh, the behavior of, of linear waves. Now, um, for large deformations in the membrane, uh, this is not the correct equation to use uh, to model the propagation of waves. But for small deformations, this linear wave equation turns out to be a very good model of propagating waves. And what I want to do is show you this uh, for a given initial condition. So what you see plotted here is uh, a display of a given initial condition. On the left is the graph of this membrane, the initial condition that we're putting in the membrane. And on the right is a contour plot showing both uh, the uh, displacement of points in the membrane in color, so red and blue, and the gradient in black. Um, so the magnitude of the gradient uh, of this uh, displacement. And I'm going to plot the exact solution of this wave equation as it depends on time for t from 0 to 20. And so we can see that the wave uh, proceeds um, bouncing off the boundaries and uh, we're getting a very good picture here of exactly uh, what the solution for this uh, this wave equation looks like. So believe it or not, this is uh, actually one of the more basic models, even though solving it actually requires a substantial amount of 
uh, mathematics, um, the linear wave equation is not uh, not typically the best model to use, and there are actually many more advanced nonlinear wave equations uh, that are actually better uh, suited to uh, you know model reality. Um, I'm not going to write the equations down right now, but I will name them. Uh, one of the, the main ones is the Corwig de Vries equation, which shows up in uh, many areas of modeling uh, advanced fluid flow, uh, as well as in many different areas of quantum mechanics. Uh, these are sometimes called KDV type equations or the KDV equation. Um, and believe it or not, we'll be able to use some of the methods that we're going to develop in this course by the end of it uh, to uh, actually solve this, this uh, equation and equations like this. Um, another very, very, very important system of nonlinear uh, partial differential equations are the so-called uh, Euler equations. of gas dynamics. These are extremely important in um, studying and understanding the behavior of shock waves. In gas flow uh, over uh, various um, different geom geometrical objects. Now these, these equations are uh, much, much more complicated than, than the standard linear wave equation, and um, solving them uh, exactly analytically in three dimensions is still an open problem in uh, mathematics. However, uh, there are ways of uh, numerically solving both these types of equations. Um, specifically the Euler equations. Uh, what I'm going to show right now is um, uh, some experimental uh, results and then uh, corresponding numerical solutions of the Euler equations for different scenarios. So what you see right here is uh, experimental results from the University of New South, South Wales um, showing a shock wave uh, proceeding through a material uh, and then interacting with the boundary. And um, you see two separate videos here. The first video is the shockwave interacting with um, uh, a square obstacle. And the second video is a shockwave um, proceeding and interacting with uh, a parabolic boundary. Uh, in both videos, you can see the very complicated behavior of the shockwave, specifically the formation of you know, eddies uh, or rotational uh, flow in gas. Um, this is behavior that can't be adequately modeled using a linear wave equation. Uh, however, uh, the system of Euler equations uh, can uh, very accurately um, reproduce uh, these effects very, very nicely. And what you see here is um, a numerical simulation of the solution to the Euler equations, uh, which is uh, recapturing all of this very complicated behavior uh, that we're seeing in real-world experiments. But uh, this is coming directly from a computational simulation of the correct mathematical equations of gas dynamics. Um, <clears throat> And I think it's very, very, very convincing. Uh, and you know, you're seeing the formation of these eddies, uh, as well as uh, all of the real world results in terms of uh, how the shocks uh, actually do uh, propagate through the material, uh, the, the gas, uh, in uh, uh, the real world uh, experimental results. So I think this is very convincing and very shows very, very strong evidence 
make that uh, uh, sometimes using the more advanced model, even though it's uh, more difficult to get uh, computational or analytic results, uh, is very fruitful and uh, very, very important to consider. So I have one more example that I want to give of this uh, uh, idea of, you know, relatively basic model compared to more advanced model. This is the example of gravitation theory, this, the theory of gravity. And there are two main theories of gravity. There are many theories of gravity that have been developed, but the two main theories of gravity that have been uh, developed by, by physical scientists and by humanity are uh, the Newtonian theory of gravity, or Newton's theory of gravity, and that of uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, Albert Einstein. And I'll also include, because I include special relativity over here, I'll include Newton's theory of mechanics and gravitation. So we'll start out by comparing and contrasting these two uh, major developments in scientific understanding of mechanics and gravitation. Newton developed his theory around 1687, and there is some controversy between whether he uh, discovered parts of the theory and others discovered parts of the theory, like Robert Hooke, um, but we'll, we'll uh, avoid that controversy for now by just saying it's Newton's theory of gravity, and start out by saying this is an extremely successful theory of mechanics and gravitation. is so successful, in fact, that this theory was actually used to achieve the moon landing. In the Apollo missions, which is one of the, 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 the biggest achievements of mankind. It's also used by current day uh, astronomers and astronauts in current day missions where relativistic corrections are not needed.
we can use uh, Newton's theory of gravitation to actually prove, mathematically prove, Kepler's three laws. And this is something I do in my, uh, my graduate engineering mathematics class. So Kepler's laws, uh, you remember, uh, are uh, three main laws of motion, one being that planetary orbits follow uh, what are called conic sections, or uh, ellip ellipses, parabolas, or hyperbolas. Um, it also, they also relate the, the area of traversal to the, the, the period of, of motion. Mm -hmm and uh, give you a relationship between the, the period and the length of the semi-major axis of an orbit of a planet around a massive body. This, um, th this theory is also easier to apply and use than relativity. I put this in quotation marks here because uh, there are some, some caveats, but in, in general, it's much easier to apply. And use. Then Einstein's theory of relativity. However, there are for all of the, the benefits of this, this theory, there are uh, some major limitations. And perhaps, you know, the, one of the, the most historic and biggest limitation was its failure to uh, calculate the, the precession of various planets, of the perihelion of various planets. Specifically, Mercury, uh, its prediction is way off. Another limitation is that the angular deflection of light, or light rays, around gravitational bodies is also way off. For instance, you know, if you have the, the sun here, and you're on the earth right here, light rays as they pass the sun, if they're coming in like this, end up getting deflected by the gravitation of the body. So. Uh, for instance, if you're looking at a star and you see a star in this direction from the Earth, um, the actual location of that star is over here. And this is, uh, this is uh, because of the gravitation of the, the, the sun, it actually deflects light rays 
this is not well predicted um, at all by Newton's theory of gravity. And um, in general, for this the Newton's theory of gravitation, errors build up over time. Which means it's not good for long time spans, or for predicting over long time spans. So this is a summary of Newton's theory of gravity mechanics and gravitation. On the other hand, we have Einstein's theory of special and general relativity. Einstein published his papers around 1916, and this is also an extremely successful theory of gravitation. This is definitely uh, a, a very, very, very big theory because it, it fundamentally changes the idea of space and time. Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity is actually required for, uh, to create modern GPS systems and uh, a number of other uh, modern systems. And uh, in general, uh, by greatly overhauling a lot of you know, the fundamental ideas of space and time and fundamental ideas in physics, um, the theory uh, addresses and explains and corrects the limitations of Newton's theory. while simultaneously better explaining why gravity works. And in general, it's much harder to correctly understand apply and solve problems.
in general relativity. There are definitely some other limitations to this theory as well. Extreme scenarios. Such as very, very large mass, like black holes. Um, we have complications because uh, we, there's a fundamental you know, misunderstanding of um, how general relativity, which works at large, large scales for very large distances and large scales between planets, um, interacts well with quantum mechanics, uh, which is the theory of the very small, so uh, extremely small uh, fundamental particles. Um, so in general, right, Einstein's theory of relativity uh, doesn't mesh well with quantum mechanics. And this is actually one of the biggest problems in physics right now is to uh, find a new physical theory that um, that gives us uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity but meshes that with quantum mechanics. But in terms of just theories of gravitation, the more most the more modern theory and some people will say the better theory is Einstein's theory of the special and general relativity. But I wouldn't say that it's better. I just think that it's more modern and it's more accurate. It's a more accurate theory. And significant accomplishments in mankind have been achieved by both both theories. Um, you know, World changing accomplishments have been uh, have have been uh, attained using both both these theories. <clears throat> What's also important to note, and this is the final note that I'll make on this example, is that uh, sometimes if you have uh, one theory that's less accurate, one theory that's more accurate, uh, you can address and use uh, the less accurate theory while introducing corrections from the, 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 the more accurate theory. So uh, for this example, right, Newton's law I should say Newton's theory of gravitation can often be used with and is often used with what are called relativistic corrections. tacked on or attach. Which um, will correct for uh, correct Newton's laws and add in the corrections um, that we, 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 we know are actually true and observed in real life uh, that can be explained via relativity. And we'll investigate this a little bit later on in the course when we get some, some, uh, some development uh, into our, our, our toolbox, or our technique. But the main thing you want to be thinking about, thinking of in this course, and in general when you're learning mathematics, is uh, how it's adding to your toolbox uh, for mathematical modeling and for uh, figuring out problems using mathematics. So what I want to do now is just um, give a, a, a quick overview of uh, the general modeling framework uh, and what uh, mathematical modeling you know, problem consists of and uh, how it's typically a very large process.
And just like the previous definition, uh, this, this process can be found in uh, My- Meyer Humey's book, and I, I very strongly recommend uh, taking a look at the book because it's a very, very nice um, and very, very, very a, you know, extremely de- detailed and um, informative uh, summary of uh, how to make a mathematical model and very, very in-depth as well. The step zero in this process is to set up as precisely as possible the reasons for constructing the model. and its objectives. So, for example, um, if you're making a model of the weather, uh, and you want to predict the weather, um, do you want to predict the weather for a day, Do you want to predict the weather for an hour? Do you want to predict the weather for uh, a week? Each one of those questions is uh, a different question. It's a a dip. They all are very difficult questions, but uh, they have very, uh, very, very different um, uh, difficulties associated with them. And uh, as you can see, if you look at your local weather forecasts. Um, you don't really get much uh, accuracy even within uh, a, a few days uh, for weather forecasts. So the next step, step one, is to study the problem as it is in real life. And this involves doing a, a lot of research um, uh, to, to figure out exactly uh, what the problem is you're dealing with, and um, you know what uh, exactly is going on. Uh, it's also setting up for the next step, step two, which is uh, data collection and analysis in real life. And this is where you go out into the field or you, you collect uh, data from laboratories and um, you, 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 you collect real world data um, to a- analyze. And this actually then leads into step three. Where you design controlled laboratory studies. and simulations. And then the the last two steps here step four and step five step four is the construction of a conceptual qualitative model
And notice that I'm using the word qualitative here, not quantitative. And the last step here is uh, conclusions, making conclusions, predictions, and recommendations that follow from this qualitative model. And that's the last step of this process. And these five steps um, are the, the, the form the basis of um, a, a given model in, in science. But um, essentially, the, these steps are very often not enough. And this is these 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 steps are only the beginning of the modeling process. So these five steps, and I've just made a box around these steps because they all uh, together form the basis for what's called a qualitative model. And uh, these are used very, very often. Um, and they're, they're, they are it, it, they are useful and can be useful, but it's important to point out that uh, while qualitative models are you know they, they're in, they, they are extensively used in the social sciences, And they're also used in the, the, the physical sciences, the natural sciences and engineering as well. But um, it's important to find it's important to point out that um, they are really accepted as fact in the natural sciences. And by natural sciences here, we're talking about physics, chemistry, biology, et cetera, et cetera. In these fields, we have to perform additional steps. Which lead to a mathematical quantitative model.
And notice my, my use of the word quantitative here rather than qualitative. So forming a qualitative model is very often you know, a, a very useful first step and very important uh, when constructing a, a, a given theory, uh, a given phys physical theory or, uh, or a given uh, mathematical model. But we need to do more um, as, as uh, natural scientists, uh, engineers, uh, and you know, applied mathematicians to uh, construct real-world models.